Have you ever been in a situation where you felt trapped or stuck or confined or tied up? A situation where you just couldn't get out of it, like maybe you were stuck on an airplane on a tarmac or something? When I was a kid growing up, I, I, I uh, was living in the Annapolis Valley, I saw commercials on TV every now and then for Crystal Palace in Moncton. And I would think, oh, someday I'm going to go to Crystal Palace. Wouldn't that be amazing? And they've got the roller coaster and all these different things. And so finally, we never really did trips like that much as a family growing up. But finally, when I was in high school, we did a uh, band trip to Moncton and I got to go to Crystal Palace. I was so excited. And I rode the roller coaster, and I went on the crazy submarine, and I did the arcade things and all that stuff. But there was one thing, and I remember in my mind, I could see it on the commercial for Crystal Palace. The one thing I really wanted to do, I was so looking forward to it, was the great big spinny swing ride thing, right? Anyone remember that? The Crystal Palace, big, these swings, and you get on, and then it goes, and you start, and you fly out, and you go crazy. So I was so excited. So finally, I did everything else, and then the last thing I'm going to do is go on that spinny ride. So I finally got in, and I got strapped in, locked in, and then it starts, and we start going around and around and around, and almost immediately, I knew I do not want to be (laughs) on this thing. My stomach started doing gymnastics. Now, thankfully, there was no incident to report, Um, but I tell you what, I felt trapped on that thing. I just wanted to get off Every time I'd fly past the operator, I was probably going, can you turn it off? Can I turn it off? Uh, please turn it off. Um, but no, I had to wait until we were done. And that was just an agonizing, terrifying few minutes that I was on that thing. I do not like to feel trapped. By the way, when I got off, I did nothing else the rest of the day. I just sat and I said, that's it. That's when I learned that I do not like spinny rides. Um, I do not like to feel trapped. I can't, re- nobody really would like to feel trapped, would they? I mean, I think as human beings, we need escape routes. We need off ramps. We need uh, exits. Some of you are like introverts or you don't like crowds. And if, when you get into a room, the first thing you look for is where is the nearest exit so I can get out of here if I need to. And if you're in church and you're stuck in the middle of a row, you're like, ah, I need to get to the end of the aisle so I can get out of here. Um, I get it. We are creatures that need and crave freedom. And yet, so many people found them, find themselves bound up, bound up by different things, different circumstances, or ways of thinking in their life, bound up by troubles, bound up by addictions or habits, bound up by health problems, bound up by anxieties, bound up by resentment or bitterness, bound up by religion even. And we just long to be free. Today we're going to look at a story in the scriptures of a woman who was bound up until she met Jesus. And I want you to hear this simple message. It's not something that you haven't heard before. I'm not coming up with anything new this morning, but I just really want you to hear it and let it sink in deep into your soul. And the message is this, that freedom is found in Jesus. Freedom is found in Christ and his kingdom. The, the series, uh, just a little mini-series that we're doing here in the month of August is titled Jesus and Women. Now, normally I would have slides, but I got home from Oasis and I just, my tank was empty and I said, I'm not doing any slides. They're going to have to accept that. I'm sorry, but... I'm sorry, not sorry. I'm not really sorry. I didn't have the energy to make slides, so there's no slides, but that's all right. Um, If you have your Bible, you can turn there to Luke chapter 13. That's where we're going to be today. This little series on Jesus and women, um, we're focusing on some of the encounters that Jesus had with women uh, in the Gospels. We see in all of these encounters how Jesus honored and elevated women. He showed them uh, compassion and grace and love. Last week, uh, we had Charles Taylor here, the interim director, co-director of Camp Pegwiak, and he talked about the woman caught in adultery. Today, the woman bent double. Now, this is a lesser-known story, I think, 
Um, it's a little short passage here in Luke 13. And uh, I'm going to read this morning from the English Standard Version. I use different translations depending on which one I seem to like the best uh, for the particular passage. usually use the New Living Translation, but today I'm using Luke, uh, the English Standard Version. Luke 13, starting at verse 10. And if you don't have a Bible, there's some down in the seats in front of you. Starting at verse 10, I'll read the, uh, to verse 17. Now he, that's Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Some translations say she was bent double. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Amen. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his holy word. All right, so let's go. I'm going to work through this passage verse by verse. It says in verse 10 that Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. So let's set this up a little bit. Let's set the scene Um, This is later in Jesus' ministry. He's just starting out now on his way to Jerusalem for the last time. And as he's going on this tour towards Jerusalem where we know he will be crucified, uh, he's stopping along the way and doing various things, including stopping at synagogues. And he's speaking there on the Sabbath day. And his popularity is growing and opposition is also growing too. It's a bit of a powder keg environment. Uh, But Jesus was not scared of controversy or afraid to step into potentially hostile situations. And so here he was on the Sabbath day, on Saturday, the day of rest, teaching in the synagogue as he had the habit of doing. In fact, we we see in other times that Jesus uh, speaking in in synagogues all the time. And the first time uh, is in Luke chapter 4 when he's in his hometown of uh, Nazareth and he speaks in the synagogue. And it says... uh, Uh, that he, in Luke chapter 4, he gets the scroll of prophet Isaiah and he unrolled it and he found the place where it's written uh, this. And and he quotes from Isaiah, he reads from Isaiah, starting in Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He reads from Isaiah. Then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue are upon him, fixed on him. And then he has this very short nine word sermon, nine words, very short message. He says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and everybody freaked out and it was awesome. Okay. That's a great, it's a great scene. I love that scene. But this message that he shares from the, from Isaiah about the kingdom, the kingdom is coming. And God has proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor and that there's going to be recovery of sight to the blind and all this sort of stuff. People are going to be healed and the poor are going to have good news and freedom, liberty, liberty to captives, liberty to those who are oppressed. This was a a recurring message that runs through um, the rest of his ministry and his teaching. And we're going to see that kind of coming out in Luke 13. And so here he is uh, in a synagogue again on, a, on the Sabbath teaching, and he performs a miracle. And this wasn't the only time that he performed a miracle in a synagogue on the Sabbath. He also healed the man with the unclean spirit in Mark chapter 1 and the man with the withered hand, hand in Mark chapter 3. So here he is again. We don't know what he was teaching that day, but probably because this was the, his habit, he was probably teaching on the kingdom of God, the nature of the kingdom of God. 
and something happens. Jesus notices a woman who has come to listen to him. And it says in verse 11, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. She was disabled. She was hunched over. Um, Some translations say she was crippled or disabled by an evil spirit. Uh, Based on the Greek, I think that this is why I'm using the English Standard Version. I like how they put it today, that she had a disabling spirit. I think that's a better translation, probably the best translation, or a spirit of disability. And I think the reason that I want to bring this up is I think we should be clear here that this is likely not saying that her illness was literally directly caused by a demonic spirit or that she was demon-possessed, and that's what brought about this. Um, because when Jesus heals her, he doesn't cast out a demon. There are other times that he does cast demons out of people, but he doesn't do that in this case. Um, So it's likely that's not what they mean. More likely what this should tell us is is just this sort of reality, this sort of supernatural reality that it's hard for us to fully understand, but that, that naturally caused illnesses, diseases, and disabilities are ultimately connected in, in some way that we can't fully understand to the unseen forces of evil that are at work in our fallen world. Uh, it reminds me of when the Apostle Paul said that he, when he was talking about his thorn in the flesh, some physical disability that he had, and he, he describes it as a messenger of Satan to buffet me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, uh, that, that somehow his physical disability is uh, tied in some way to, the, to a, a spiritual reality. Um, But as we talked about in our last teaching series, I'm not going to go over all that again, but we should not think of God generally as the perpetrator of human illness. Rather, human suffering falls into the the category of the uh, the result of living in in the kind of world in which we live, a world that includes a certain degree of brokenness um, and evil, a world tainted by sin, and that one day when God brings his kingdom fully And permanently, it will mean the eradication of suffering and pain and disease and sickness and all of that. Amen? Amen. Okay. So in the first century mind, in the first century culture, unlike ours, where who who, they were much more in in tune with uh, how spiritual realities and physical realities overlap, this woman's woman's infirmity was, uh, was not merely natural, but was to some extent the work of spiritual forces opposed to God's desire for her to thrive and be healthy, and so she was experiencing some sort of oppression or captivity spiritually. And so, she was suffering for 18 years. She suffered, bent over, hunched over with some sort of spinal issue. 18 years of chronic pain. Some of you know what that's like. Some of you have lived with chronic pain. Do you understand that? It can be debilitating. It's life-altering. It can be dream-crushing. Things do not go as you wanted them, as you imagined they would, because you live with this chronic illness. And so this is this woman, and she comes into the synagogue, and Jesus saw her. He saw her. It says in verse 12, when Jesus saw her, he called her over. And he, said, and, and, he, and he said to her, and then he speaks into her life. Now, she didn't even come asking. She probably, I wouldn't be surprised, stopped at praying for healing some time ago. She probably tried a lot of things that to relieve and, and heal her, and nothing worked. I suspect she was feeling extremely discouraged, hopeless, like she was a lost cause, and, and maybe there was just a little spark of faith there that she went to the, the synagogue that day hearing that Jesus, this healer, was going to be in town. And just maybe, oh, probably not, but, you know, it's worth a try. Maybe I'll just go to the synagogue this day just to see maybe if something might happen. And that's all she had to do. That's all she had to do. She came to Jesus, and then Jesus did the rest. She came to Jesus, and then Jesus did the rest. That's all she had to do. And I love that we don't have to work for the mercy of God. We don't have to work and earn God's grace and favor in our lives. We just have to come to Jesus, and he will do the rest. So Jesus saw her, 
And that's, that's, that's his heart. That's our Jesus. He sees you. When you might feel invisible, when you might feel like nobody cares about what you're going through, Jesus sees you, and Jesus called her to himself. He drew her in. He called her over, and then he spoke. And he's, what did he speak? He spoke freedom. He said, woman, you are freed from your disability. You are freed. He didn't just see a woman who was bent over. He didn't just see a physical ailment. He saw into her soul. He saw her mental, emotional, and spiritual condition. He saw that she was bound up by this. It wasn't just a physical disability. It was spiritual captivity. And the power of his words, look what they did. He laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. It's another incredible miracle that was a sign of Jesus' power and kingship and the coming of the kingdom of God, but not just a miracle. It was also an act of love and compassion on a woman who had been held captive to her suffering for 18 long years. And I love the woman's response, so appropriate. She glorified God. What, there is no better response. This is the most appropriate response to the work of Jesus Christ in our lives, to, but to worship and praise and say, hallelujah. I don't know what it looked like that day. Maybe she was running around like she was in a Pentecostal church service doing some the Holy Ghost dancing. I don't know. Shouting hallelujah. Or maybe she just fell to her knees and just, uh, maybe she f- fell with her face to the ground. We don't know. It doesn't tell us what she did, but she glorified God. Just imagine her heart. The freedom that she felt for the first time in 18 years. Now, you could end the story there and say, praise God, what a great story. This is wonderful, and, and we could go out of here today and encouraged, and that's it. But that's not where the story ends, because we now see uh, this stark contrast between the compassion of Jesus, this moment of the kingdom of God breaking through into the world where we see the power of Christ on display, uh, we, could, we see that contrasted with cold, dead, oppressive religion. Verse 14. But the ruler of the synagogue, every synagogue would have had a local sort of ruler who was overseeing it, uh, he was indignant, indignant, angry, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. He was indignant because, Je- not just because, I mean, he, there was probably lots of reasons why he was a little skeptical of this Jesus character and all that he was doing. But the, the thing that really ticked him off was that Jesus healed on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, commanded by God, one of the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, and they weren't supposed to do work on the Sabbath day. It was supposed to be a day of rest. And so here he sees this happen, and he got all tiffed. And, and this ruler felt that Jesus had violated the law of Moses. This is unforgivable. You cannot do that. But Jesus hadn't violated the law of Moses. Jesus wasn't breaking the Hebrew laws around Sabbath. He was violating tradition. That's all he was violating, was rabbinic tradition. You see, the rabbis over the centuries added rules. They kept adding rules upon rules and regulations and stipulations uh, that essentially said, okay, well, if you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, here's what it means. It means you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't do this, and you can't do this specific thing, and if you do that, you're violating the Sabbath. And they add all these extra rules, and about 100 years, about 100 years after Jesus, they were actually written down into a book, a Mishnah, on, on Shabbat, you can read it. I read it. I, I, well, I skimmed it, to be honest. To be fair, I didn't read the whole thing. It's 24 chapters. 24 chapters long of all the things you cannot do on the Sabbath. And a lot of them are silly. Like, make sure you don't put an egg too close to something hot in case it might cook a little. Like, seriously, that's one of them. Uh, they are not the law of God. That is not the law of God around the Sabbath. And we could get a whole other conversation about the law and how Jesus fulfills it and all that. But there's certainly no scripture that says someone cannot be miraculously healed on the Sabbath. Jesus was not violating the law in any way. He was simply smashing their religious tradition. And I kind of like that about Jesus. I kind of like that he was a rule breaker. eh? He was a holy troublemaker, wasn't he? 
I have a bit of that in me, to be honest. Yeah. I remember, uh, again, back to my, my teenage years uh, in, my, in my childhood church, and there was a little bit of legalism in my childhood church, a little bit of this sort of adding rules to the Bible that weren't, weren't there. And I really didn't like it when people in authority told me what I could and couldn't do uh, when their rules did not line up with the scriptures, like, like the pastor insisting that every time, if I'm going to be behind the pulpit, I must be wearing a necktie. A necktie. Well, show me, in, show me chapter and verse, please. You can see today I don't wear a necktie. Uh, every now and then I might pull one out, but that's just my free choice to do that, not because I feel like I have to. Uh, or my youth leader, the worst one was my youth leader telling me that I cannot listen to Pink Floyd. She said, she said, no, that's druggy music. I said, well, I don't do drugs, and I love it, and why should all the non-Christians get all the good music? So um, I, I still get really frustrated with religious legalism, and I think Jesus was like this too. He didn't care about the rules uh, that had nothing to do with God's heart and God's law, and, and this, the rule that you can't heal someone on the Sabbath, that's a stupid rule, and it misses the point of Sabbath. Uh, But the religious leaders didn't see it this way, and this one particular synagogue ruler, he was so incensed that Jesus broke the rules that that he he completely lost and missed this gracious and mighty act of God that happened right before his eyes. But he couldn't see it because he was so focused on the religious rules. And so he turns to his congregation and he says to them, and he addresses them. Notice he doesn't address Jesus. He doesn't, he's too chicken to confront Jesus. But he turns to the crowd. And he says to them, well, come get your healing on any other day. But, but rules are rules, people. You can't do it on Sabbath. But Jesus is not afraid to defend his ministry. And then the Lord answered him, verse 15, you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, she's a, she's a Jewish woman, she's, she's loved by God, whom Satan bound for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? He calls them hypocrites. And he always you know, reserved his harshest judgment and criticism for religious people. And here he calls them hypocrites. These guys say, who say you can't be healed on the Sabbath are the same people who have the common sense and decency to untie their animals and find them something to drink, whether it's the Sabbath day or not. He says, you hypocrites, you'll make exceptions for animals, but not for this woman. And Jesus rightly calls them out on it. Is not this woman more valuable than an animal? And I love that Jesus calls them out on it, and I think we should speak out as well against religious hypocrisy in our world today because the world is watching and they've noticed hypocrisy amongst Christians. And it is not helping. It is not helping us convince people to follow our Jesus. Now, we're all hypocrites to one degree or another, but you know what I'm talking about. And Jesus calls them out. And he says, here's a woman who is bound up. She's bent down and bound up. And you're willing to loose the ropes that hold your donkey any day of the week. But when I loose this woman from her mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical bondage, you get angry? What is wrong with you people? Jesus says. They didn't really want her to be free, did they? They actually want to restrict her even further with religious bondage. So let's just talk for a minute just about religion. You know, I really believe that part of Jesus' mission was to shut down this kind of cold, heartless religion that we often see in our world and that was a reality in Jesus' world. Uh, In fact, the word religion itself, um, some have said, come from the Latin, two Latin words, re and ligare, re meaning again, and ligare, where we get the word ligament, meaning uh, to, uh, uh, to, to bind something. Again, bind, or return to bondage. The word religion itself 
in its root has this idea of bondage. And despite the fact that Christianity is the largest religion in the world, Jesus did not come to start a religion, to bind people into a set of rules and, and rituals. He came to bring about the kingdom of God and invite people into relationship with God through him. Religion is all about believing the right things and behaving the right ways. Now, of course, we should try to get our beliefs right, and we should behave ourselves. We should seek to live holy lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. Don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? I'm not saying we should just be free to live willy-nilly however we want. That's not what I'm saying, no. But religion puts those things, that the, the, the outward performance at the forefront and demands that we, we perform correctly in order to get our reward uh, for good behavior at the end. It's all works-based. It's loveless. That's religion. But what Jesus calls us into is relationship. Not religion, but relationship with God. He calls us to participate in his kingdom. And the heart of the kingdom is not about believing the right things or behaving the right ways. It's about being transformed into a new kind of life where the eternal God is in us, transforming us, and works through us to transform the world. Legalistic religion is interested in controlling people and, and outward behavior modification. The kingdom of God and Christ are interested in setting people free and life transformation. Amen? Amen. And so because the synagogue ruler that day was driven by religion, he completely missed the incredible thing that God was doing right in front of his eyes. Reverend David Gore says, if the doing of righteousness stops you from doing that which is good, then the right that you think you are doing probably isn't righteousness at all. The other big problem here is the lack of love for this woman. The message the woman heard that day from her local synagogue ruler was, you're not welcome here. You're a bother. You're a burden. Go away. Come back when it's more convenient for us. In other words, go away and don't come back at all. And every church needs to ask themselves, are we a church that's really seeking to show Christ's compassion to the people around us and among us who are bent over, who are bent double with illness and suffering, physical illness, mental illness, addictions, grief, bondage to sin and bad habits, destructive ways of thinking, chronic pain, trauma, and all of these things that all of us carry. One, a preacher said one time, there's a broken heart in every pew. And not just within the congregation, but outside there too. Every car that drives by, someone is struggling with something. There are people all around us seeking healing, seeking recovery, seeking freedom from the things that bind them up. And the community of Jesus Christ is supposed to be a community of grace and compassion and healing and freedom of open arms and love and mercy and patience. And we can have fantastic worship services and excellent, excellent live streams and entertaining sermons and good kids programs and fun youth events and Bible studies and home churches and dinners and outreach ministries and social activities. But if we have not love, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, we are nothing. We're nothing. It's a waste of time. We've missed the point. Now, I'm not saying we are an unloving church, but how easy it would be to get comfortable and to start to focus on ourselves more than the world around us who need to meet Jesus. How easy it would be for us to drift and coast into religion and forget about the call to be kingdom people. It actually was so appropriate. I'm almost done. It actually was so appropriate that Jesus healed this woman on the Sabbath. Because the real meaning of Sabbath is rest. It's, it's about rest. It's a huddle away from hurry. It's a break from the broken. It's a pause from the problems. It's a sanctuary from the stress. It's a day of relief 
and recuperation and release. Sabbath is a gift from God. Sabbath is a gift from God for our freedom, for our recovery, for our escape from the troubles of the world. The, Jesus says in Mark chapter 2 that Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I like how the New Living Translation puts it. He says, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. If you've got 24 pages of things you're not allowed to do because it's your Sabbath day, you have missed the point. Sabbath is a gift. Imagine that I give you a gift. I, I, I say, I've got something for you, and I bring you to a special location, and I, I say, all right, Margaret, I've got something for you. Close your eyes, and I've got a big curtain. It's behind this curtain. I say, open your eyes, and then I reveal, I move the curtain, and here's your gift, and it's a cow. You think, a cow? What am I going to do with that? You see, this thing looks like, it's a gift. Oh, it's free. Look, I got this for you. That's not a gift. If you don't have a farm, if you live in an apartment, a cow is not a gift. A cow is a terrible, it's a burden. It's smelly. You're going to have to clean up after that thing. That's not a gift. But the time, by the time of Jesus, the rabbis and Pharisees had turned the Sabbath into a cow, into, this, into a sacred cow. And, and Jesus is trying to say to them, to quote the great philosopher Bart Simpson, don't have a cow, man. <laughs> the Sabbath is not that kind of a gift. Don't turn something beautiful into something terrible. It's not supposed to be this big smelly thing that makes life harder. It's a true gift. Sabbath was made for you to actually release your stress and worries and fear, not to be burdened by more rules that make life more difficult, but to live in freedom and joy and in relationship with people and with God himself. That's what Sabbath was supposed to be all about. And I'm going to talk more about Sabbath later in the fall, so we'll, we'll talk about that and what that means for us today. But how appropriate that on this day of rest that God had designed, that God had given to the people, this is the day that Jesus released this woman from the thing that caused her the greatest suffering. And Sabbath is one of those many Bible things that foreshadows the greatest truth, which is Jesus himself. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Christ is Sabbath. It's in Christ and his kingdom where we find the rest and the release and the freedom that our souls long for. So let's finish where we started. Jesus sets people free. In Galatians 5.1, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Anytime anyone comes along and says, oh, you're a Christian, hey, well, you're, you can't really be a Christian unless you do this thing I tell you to do. Or you can't really be a Christian if you're going to keep, you know, listen to Pink Floyd. Or you can't be a Christian if you're going to go to the movie theater. Or you can't be a Christian if you don't do this or that. Stop it! Don't let anybody do that to you. That's not what it's about. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, for the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And John 8, 36 says, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. free indeed. Worship team, can you come, please? The lesson is simple. Freedom is found in Christ. This woman was bound up, bound up for 18 years, and Christ set her free. Other people came along, and tried to restrict her further with religion and legalism, and Jesus says, no way, no way. I don't know if maybe there's something today that has you bound up in chains, a physical illness, a mental illness, relationship trouble, an addiction, a bad habit, bitterness, shame. If you're bound up by anything at all, come to Jesus just like that woman did. Just come find Jesus. And especially if you're bound up by religious legalism, 
come to Jesus. Jesus is the liberator. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Jesus is where we find our rest. Furthermore, be like Jesus. Don't be one of those cold religious hypocrites. Show compassion. Love those who suffer. Love them right as they are where they are. And help people find the freedom that Jesus offers. Amen. Let's sing.